Thank you, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk with you today. Um, so what I'd like to t tell you about are, is work we're doing trying to kind of radically change the way that we build and deploy spacecraft. But before I set out into that, since probably many of you haven't heard of Tethers Unlimited, I wanted to give you a quick rundown on that. We're a small company. Uh, we develop advanced technologies for space and defense missions. Uh, as Professor uh, mentioned, we, we got started 20 years ago, uh, working, and we work mainly with NASA, uh, and DOD, and, and a number of the large aerospace primes. We started out very focused on a technology called space tethers, hence our name. Uh, and we still work a lot in that area, particularly we have several devices for end of mission deorbit of spacecraft so that they don't contribute to the growth of space debris. And we're working on several uh, defense terrestrial applications of tether technologies as well. But we've worked pretty hard at branching out into other related areas, and now we work on a number of high-performance components for very small spacecraft and a family of high-performance density radios for CubeSats and other NanoSats. And then the fourth area that we work on is uh, trying to adapt and evolve additive manufact manufacturing techniques to enable the creation of new kinds of spacecraft components as well as the creation of spacecraft components on orbit. And so that, that fourth area is what I would like to focus on today. So basically what we're trying to do is steal ideas from the 3D printing and additive manufacturing areas and find new uses for them in the space industry. And, and we're doing that both uh, in sort of terrest traditional terrestrial manufacturing of spacecraft and on orbit uh, applications as well. So in the terrestrial domain, there, there are a number of ways you can use 3D printing to create spacecraft structures and a number of potential advantages of them. The two that I'm particularly interested in are, the first is taking advantage of the layered-based nature of additive manufacturing, of 3D printing, to build up spacecraft components that have complex internal geometries and complex internal uh, den changes in density and composition to provide multifunctional capabilities. And I'll, I'll tell you about a couple of the applications that we worked on so far taking advantage of that. Additionally, in spacecraft systems, risk, particularly performance risk, is always one of the very main drivers because of the high cost of, of launching stuff into space. And it's my belief that di the, taking advantage of the digital printing aspect, going straight from design to fu final product, we can potentially significantly reduce some of the performance risks that are associated with workmanship and assembly in traditional spacecraft uh, fabrication and assembly processes. And, and I'll try to address that. Overall, what we're trying to do is, is change the way we build space, build and qualify spacecraft. Where right now, each, basically each component has to be custom designed and built and then rigorously tested, qualified, to make sure it's going to f operate properly on orbit. What we'd really like to get to is a process where we can qualify the process itself, really fully test our design tools and our fabrication processes and know that when we design and analyze something, when we send it to the printer, it's going to be exactly as we predicted. So we want to be able to qualify the process, not the final product, and thereby get to being able to do very rapid, lower cost implementation of spacecraft systems, but still achieve the high reliability that we need. So a couple of, pro of the projects that we worked on, or one that we're working on right now, is trying to develop basically 3D printed radiation shielding for spacecraft. And what we're doing is doing 3D printing with combinations of low atomic weight and high atomic weight materials, polymers and metals, and creating kind of a, a layer cake sandwich structure that is, it's called graded Z shielding, that's very highly efficient at absorbing the energetic protons and electrons 
that are in the space environment and, and which cause damage and disruption to electrical components. Uh, and, and if we do that right, we can provide shielding to particularly lo low cost commercial off the shelf components uh, with three times the performance per mass of conventional aluminum shielding. So that's, that's a project we're working on right now. Uh, currently, we have the ability to fabricate little uh, conformal covers for avionics, like we're making um, shielding covers for the radios that we're developing. But what we, what we want to get to is to be able to create uh, things like entire enclosures for electronics that have spot shielding to protect the, the particular sensitive components, as well as be able to make structural components for spacecraft mounting panels, those sorts of things that have this radiation shielding built right into them. Another project that we worked on was, uh, is, is actually how we got our feet wet in the 3D printing field, uh, is trying to address the challenge um, of, uh, of multi-layer insulation on spacecraft. Right now, m most spacecraft, they build a structure and then they wrap it in these multi-layer insulation or MLI blankets which are basically a, a whole, whole lot of layers of thin aluminized mylar or kapton. They're very delicate, they're very time consuming to fabricate, so very labor intensive and very costly. And, and what's more is their thermal performance is highly variable depending upon how they are installed on the spacecraft. If you have overlaps or gaps between these blankets, their, their, thermal, their uh, effective emissivity can change by orders of magnitude. And that's, that's a real challenge for spacecraft systems. So what we, we did was we used 3D printing to make kind of a, a satellite exoskeleton structure that's got a nice durable outer shell so it doesn't get damaged in assembly. And then it's got multiple layers, of, uh, separated layers of this uh, multi-layer insulation and then a strong inner surface for mounting components and that sort of thing. Um, and you know the the objective there is to to basically get to an exoskeleton where you can design it, pr send it to the printer, print it, and then snap it together with components, do a very rapid uh, development cycle. Um, but the important thing is on is the graph on the lower right, where we compared the performance of our simulation models to the actual performance that we measured in testing in, in a vacuum. And we found a really excellent agreement between the predictions of the model and the actual performance of these components. So that, that gives me a lot of confidence, or, or at least optimism, that if we, we can take advantage of this digital printing aspect to take out many of the risks, the performance risks or variations associated with workmanship and assembly. And so what we hope eventually to get to is to, to be able to enable extremely rapid and low cost integration cycles for spacecraft where, you know, if you need to get a, a sensor up over, uh, you know, the Ukraine in, in, in a week, um, you know, the designer could take the components that he needs, kind of a, uh, assemble them in, in three dimensions a, as necessary, and then run a, a CAD macro to wrap them in this, this radiation and uh, insulation exoskeleton, send that to the printer, get that back, click it together, and launch it, and still have very high confidence that it's going to work once it's on orbit. So that's, that's some of the things that we've been working on in kind of the trying to address the traditional approach of building spacecraft on the ground and then launching them. But uh, we're looking a little bit further towards the future. Uh, as you probably know, there are, are many aspects of our daily life that are highly dependent upon space systems, in particular large space systems. You know, a lot of our, our telecommunications relies upon large satellites with very large antenna dishes deployed up a geostationary orbit. Um, you know, our, our national defense, our, our nation's, national security is protected by assets in space with very large apertures that keep track of what's going on around the world. Um, the challenge one of the challenges with these very large space systems is that this is how we currently build and deploy them. We spend several years and many hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars finally crafting a, techni a technical work of art, and then we stick it on a vehicle and we shake the heck out of it. And we keep our fingers crossed that it's 
going to unfold and deploy and still work on orbit. Now, the big primes, the, the Boeings, Lockheed Martins, Northrop Grumman's, they figured out how to do that and have it work most of the time. But it's an extremely expensive and time-consuming process. Uh, and we think that there's got to be a better way. So can consider the spider. Does a spider create its web down on the ground and then haul it up into the trees? No, that, that would be silly. The spider gets up to its operational altitude and then it fabricates the aperture that it needs to perform its collect mission. So inspired by that, we've been working under funding from NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, or NIAC, to pursue a long-term vision of being able to create what I call a satellite chrysalis which would be composed of raw material in a compact and durable form, the software DNA assembly instructions, and then the capability to transform that raw material to fabricate and integrate components on orbit to create an operational space system. Now, if we can achieve that long-term goal, there are, several, there are a couple of significant potential benefits of that. One is that we can create apertures and baselines that are much, much larger than we can currently fold up into the available launch shrouds. And if we can do that, the net payoff will be higher power, higher resolution, higher sensitivity, and higher bandwidth for a wide range of missions, DOD, NASA, and commercial. Additionally, if we can fabricate these components on, on orbit, particularly very large components, we can optimize their design for the, the microgravity environment of space, not for the tens of Gs of shock and vibration they see for 10 minutes during launch. Additionally, we can design them to just exist in space, not, not design them to have to fold up and then unfold on orbit, and, and thereby we can significantly reduce their, their complexity. And if we can address both those aspects, we, can, we believe we can get to significant reductions in their total life cycle cost. Now, when we first set out on looking at this concept of building stuff on orbit, you know, I was a little, little naive and optimistic. I thought, oh, well, we'll just 3D, printing, 3D print everything on orbit. Let's just 3D print the whole satellite on orbit. But when we actually really got into it and started looking at kind of the business case, where does this, re does this really make sense? Where does it really make sense? Uh, you know, I know this is kind of an eye chart. We won't, won't expect you to read, uh, read the whole thing. But we looked at uh, most of the common components that go into a space system, antennas, thrusters, all, all those parts. And we looked at what it would take to be able to fabricate them. And we traded off we put together a metric to try and trade off the, the relative benefits. You know, can we make a, a dramatically new capability? Can we make it much bigger or, much, or save a lot of mass? We trade that off with the, the costs or complexity involved with that. You know, do we need extreme precision in the fabrication process? Do we need to be able to handle multi-materials? Multi Those sorts of things. And what fell out of that analysis is sort of, uh, is fairly obvious in hindsight that where it really makes sense is in creating components where bigger is better, where performance scales with size. So if we can fabricate it bigger, we can get to a higher performing system. So we've been focused on figuring out how to make thing, very large sparse systems like solar arrays, like large antennas, uh, solar sails, those, and, and trusses to support uh, long baseline sensing. Um, and we've, uh, under the, the NIAC funding, we looked at a number of uh, case studies to try and quantify as best we could the potential benefit of being able to fabricate these sy systems on orbit. One of the, the case studies we looked at that I really enjoyed uh, was the, the New Worlds Observer program, which came out of a, a different NIAC project. The idea there is, uh, is hunting for Earth-like planets around other stars. And the way they do that is they'd position this uh, kind of crazy giant sunflower-shaped occulter or star shade in between a telescope and a distant star to attenuate the light from that star so that you could image and get in interferometric data 
or, or about planets orbiting around that distant star. Um, and that, pr that provided a nice test case for us because the New Worlds Observer program put together a fairly detailed concept design using traditional but, but state-of-the-art deployable technologies. And if you compare them, um, in, in the middle of the chart is kind of a cartoonish depiction of that deployable uh, occulter design, um, wh where, which uses a number of radially deployed booms to stretch out and, and stiffen a, an opaque membrane. Now that, that deployable system, it's optimized for deployment reliability. It's not optimized for mass. If you look at it and think about the structure, it, it's not, not at all optimum for, for uh, bearing the, the thrusts and torques that the, the central spacecraft is going to apply, apply to that uh, attenuator. If instead we could take up the same amount of material and process it on orbit to create the support structure for that opaque membrane, we could do things like create structural elements that are much larger than you could possibly fit into a launch shroud, and we could continuously optimize the geometry of the structure throughout its, throughout its extent. And the net benefit that falls out of that is you can make it you know, anywhere from two to 10 times larger, depending upon what kind of component you're talking about. Okay, so we can make it bigger. What does that really mean? Well, uh, on the right here, sorry, on the left um, is shown the, uh, the, the state-of-the-art deployable approach towards creating this star shade, where they have this giant star shade that folds up like a crazy umbrella and fits, just barely fits within the largest available launch shroud. And when it gets on orbit, it's, it unfolds to be 62 meters tip to tip, which is pretty huge. Um, but if we could take the same amount of material up and process it on orbit into a, an optimized structure designed to support the, designed optimally to support the, the loads and torques that it'll see on orbit, we could make it twice as large in extent, uh, four, times the cer four times the area. What's more, we could package the, the material needed to make it into a volume 30 times smaller. And that will enable us to use a smaller, less expensive launch vehicle. So if we look at the, the net value proposition of this, okay, so we can make it twice as big. You know, does that really matter? Well, it turns out if you make it twice as big, then that enables you to look twice as close to the target star. And that, and that increases the volume within which you might find something by a factor of eight. Uh, furthermore, it actually gets the the wavelength range over which the attenuation works uh, into the range where the James Webb Space Telescope could actually do this mission. So you wouldn't necessarily need to launch a dedicated telescope to do the mission. And then the, the reduction in stowed volume would enable you to go from a Delta IV Heavy, which uh, I think that's about $200 million, um, down to a Falcon 9, which SpaceX quotes at, I think, I think somewhere between 50 and $70 million. So what that all boils down to is it would enable NASA to buy 16 times more planets per taxpayer dollar. Okay, so how, how would we really go about building a, a giant structure or component on orbit? Well, we've looked at, an, at several different architectures for implementing this, um, and this is one of them. It, it's kind of the, the more science fiction-y, cooler one that we did for NIAC because they like to have, you know, cool graphics to show off to the press. Um, so this, uh, we, we actually didn't start out intending this to look like a spider, um, but when you go through the, the uh, components, the capabilities required, it ended up kind of falling out looking like a spider, so we just kind of went with it and, and ended up with what we call a spider fab robot. Um, but, but the four critical capabilities that it needs are what I call the four M's, manufacturing, mobility, manipulation, and metrology. So this particular spider fab bot, it has multiple robotic arms for mobility and manipulation, so it can mo move material around and position structural elements. It's got manufacturing capability. It has two different kind of tools, which, because it's a spider robot, I call spinnerets, 
One of them fabricate, uses additive manufacturing to fabricate structural elements, either you know, a carbon fiber tube or carbon fiber truss, which I'll tell you more about later. Uh, and then a second one, which I call the joiner spinneret, that it uses to bond them together to build up uh, higher complexity structures. And then for metrology, we need some kind of vision or other metrology system for measuring what, we're, what we've fabricated so that we can, you know, so that we can control what we're doing in, a cl in somewhat cl closed loop form so that we can end up with the structure with the precision that we need to do the job. Uh, so this is a little bit more detail on a, a notional concept for the joiner spinneret. Uh, it's basically a, a, 3D, a 3D printer, an FDM or fused deposition modeling head that instead of being on a traditional you know, three axis um, motion system, we'd position on, a, on kind of a wrist and, and finger system so it could reach all around these structural elements and build up joints between structural elements so it can bond them together and create uh, features so that you could attach payloads or other functional elements. Um, and I wanted to point out that the, the robotic arms shown there aren't just CAD imagination. Uh, the picture there shows a, a robotic arm that we delivered to NRL last year. Uh, it was a, a small, very compact, but highly dexterous robotic arm intended for satellite servicing type missions. Uh, and two of them will fold up into the volume of a 3U CubeSat. Uh, so that, that's real hardware that we've been working on. So um, one, of the, one of the most interesting potential applications of this approach would be building large antennas for telecommunications, for signals, collection, those sorts of missions. Uh, and th this illustrates a, a notional approach to have this spider robot crawling around building up a, a giant hoop-like structure across which it could then stretch a reflective membrane to, to create an antenna very much like the, uh, the Northrop Grumman AstroMesh antenna. Now, if you, we, we looked, so we looked at the, the value proposition for doing this, and this graph shows uh, the, the mass and the estimated cost of many of the, the, the current state-of-the-art deployable antenna systems. And you can see there that the, the cost of those antennas goes up very rapidly with size. And that's, that's because if you're building it on the ground, you know, to make a, a really large antenna, you need a really large facility. It's very complex to be able to get it to fold up and stow within a launch shroud and then deploy reliably. So, so their cost scales very severely with size. If instead we can fabricate those antennas on orbit, we'll have to pay a certain amount for that robotic capability. That, that robotic, that spider fab robot. And we've estimated that cost at about $50 million. And then because I'm always a little too optimistic, I multiplied by two and came out with $100 million. But then if you want to create a bigger antenna aperture, basically you just need to feed the spider more material and wait a longer time. So the cost of the aperture is going to scale much more gently with its size. And that will enable us to be able to create really large antenna apertures, 100, you know, football field sized antennas, football stadium sized antennas at a reasonable cost. And, and we've looked at the, the amount of mass and the time needed to do something like create a antenna reflector the size of the Arecibo radio dish down in uh, Puerto Rico, 300 meters. You know, that, that's bigger than football stadium size. Um, and if we do it right, we can get the, the, the mass and the time down to reasonable levels. In this case, for that, that hoop structure and the, the reflective membrane, came out, out to about two metric tons, which is very reasonable given current launch system capabilities. And it would take that robot something on the order of two months to build the structure. And if you had more robots, you could do it faster. So, so those are both reasonable numbers. Okay, so how are we actually going to build these structures on orbit? Well, we, we're pr are pursuing an approach that we call spider fab um, that combines aspects from 3D printing, robotic assembly, and automated composite layup. And we're kind of stealing and morphing those 
those capabilities together to, to create this system. Now in the 3D printing aspect of it, uh, m most 3D printers are basically a box that can make an object smaller than the box. But for what we want to do, we want to have a tool that can make something much, much larger than itself. So we kind of need to turn the 3D printer inside out. But there's some significant challenges there. One is how do you maintain the, the, the positioning precision needed to pull off these additive manufacturing processes when you've turned the thing inside out? And then how do you manage the, the maintain the thermal control necessary for these processes to work reliably? So those are two of the, the challenges that we're working on now under our current funding from NIAC. Um, and then because, uh, because we're talking, you know, crazy talk like making kilometer scale apertures, several hundred meter scale antennas, we really have to optimize the heck out of the whole thing and, and use the highest performance material that we can possibly work with. So we've been focused on approaches that can use um, composite materials, carbon fiber, um, for one project we're looking at basalt fiber composites, those sorts of things. And one of the tools that we're working on is this device we call a trussellator, which basically takes as uh, takes a spool of carbon fiber material and does kind of additive manufacturing type processes to fabricate and extrude essentially infinitely long continuous carbon fiber trusses. And we're very fortunate to uh, be able to transition our NIAC funding into a, a phase one SBIR with NASA Langley and we've been selected for a phase two on that under which we'll continue to develop it and demonstrate that it works in, in, uh, in a vacuum environment. Um, so now I wanted to show you uh, a movie of a demo we did very, right at the very end of our phase one uh, SBIR. Um, I got a little bit silly putting this together, so forgive me. So th this was um, a demonstration we did at, at the very end of a six-month project. So it was kind of, kind of, uh, we're, we're real happy we got it done in time for the end of the project. Um, so this demo shows it fabricating a truss and pulling out some fake solar solar panels. Um, and this is, this is running about 30 times real time. So it actually took about five minutes to stretch this out. Uh, and, whoops. So for the Super Bowl, we took it out back and used it to raise the flag. Um, and so we looked at the, the performance of these trusses we're fabricating. We took one of the, the very first samples that we made out of this trussellator machine and tested it tested its bending stiffness, and then compared that to the performance of, of all, basically all of the uh, flight heritage deployable masts and booms, the stuff that's flown before. And uh, when you account for variations in the diameter of the, of the truss or boom and the amount of material put into it, these very first samples we made perform, have higher structural efficiency than all those flight heritage components. And that's because we, we, they don't need all the latches and mechanisms required for the thing to unfold on orbit. And, and these samples were made with fairly low cost uh, um, standard modulus carbon fiber. We, we've got some, some medium or high modulus carbon fiber materials in that we're gonna start working with. Um, and, and we see significant headroom for further improvement on the performance of those trusses. So the, the uh, the program that funded this trussellator work is NASA Langley's project where they're looking at uh, deploying a 300 kilowatt solar array to support a solar electric propelled uh, mission out to Mars or to the, or to the asteroids. Um, so we looked at what it would take to, uh, how we could go about building up a large solar array system with this capability. And in this particular approach, we in this particular project, we wanted to stay away from this kind of crazy spider fab robot with all these multi-degree of freedom robotic arms and come up with a somewhat more sane uh, architecture for implementing this capability. And we, 
after some fits and starts, we worked out that we could um, have a, a work cell located on the main spacecraft that could build these trusses and kind of move itself back and forth along them and, and deploy a solar array that looks just like the, the conventional deployable array that NASA is considering doing, which would require significant uh, on-orbit assembly by, astro by astro astronauts. Oops. Uh, and this is another eye chart. Um, but the net takeaway of, of this is that if we compare the mass of uh, the, the, the government reference array, kind of the baseline design, with what we could do if we fabricated on orbit, we can get to, to ma uh, structural mass savings of two to five times. So those, those are very significant mass savings that we could achieve. And this is kind of a notional illustration of this work cell that would have one, maybe two robotic arms for positioning materials, a tool for fabricating the trusses, another tool for joining those trusses together, and then the capability to, to you know, unroll the, the photovoltaic arrays and, and move itself back and forth along the truss. And one of the things we hope to do, um, and we've proposed to NASA, would be to create kind of a small palletized version of this that could, that could be launched up to the space station and take advantage of the existing robotic arm capabilities that are, that are already up there to fabricate and assemble uh, a, a large system based upon these trusses. We could do something like make a solar electric propulsion system that could, you know, you could build it at the space station, then it could move itself up to geostationary orbit or we could create a very large uh, phased array uh, system for, for synthetic aperture radar applications or even communications applications. So that, that's kind of where we're hoping to go with it in the not too distant future, uh, the, the SBIR God's willing. Um, so there, there are a number of technologies required to implement this architecture that we've laid out. And there are a number of significant technical risks that we're going to have to address. Um, these, are, these are just some of them shown here. The top one in my mind is how do we manage the thermal vacuum environment and, and still be able to uh, you know, perform these additive manufacturing techniques. Because in the space environment, temperatures uh, of surfaces can vary by hundreds of degrees depending upon whether you're in eclipse or in sunlight or which direction the sun is coming from. So that's a very challenging problem to address and that's what we're, one of the things we're working on right now. We're putting together an experiment that'll go into a, a large vacuum chamber that we've set up um, to, to demonstrate we can do these processes. We also need to work on the reliability of the system. If we're gonna build a, you know, a football stadium sized antenna, that's gonna be thousands or hundreds of thousands of components and joints that we need to put together and you know what if ha what happens if something goes wrong something breaks something jams you know how do how do we deal with that and get that to be reliable enough to work um, one of kind of intellectually for me one of the most interesting challenges is the last one listed there and that is that uh, this is really this approach is really going to break many of the processes that NASA and the DOD uses for uh, developing and integrating and testing their spacecraft systems because you're no longer going to be able to do integrated testing with your flight article. You know, you don't build that flight article until you've already paid for and performed the launch. And, and that's going to be, I think that's going to be a real challenge for a lot of the real traditional-minded people within NASA. So, you know, we're aware of that. and, and trying to figure out how to address that. One advantage that we have, or, or several of them, but one, of, one is that um, once we've developed and demonstrated this capability on orbit, this tool, then we have a flight qualified system, a flight proven system, and we can reuse it many times to create many different systems, many different components. So in that way, once we get over that initial barrier, we think we can get to significant reductions in schedule and cost for many different programs. And we have laid out a kind of a technology maturation plan uh, in trying to, trying to do it in a stepwise manner. So we're not trying to bite it off all at one time, 
Well, we'll start off with a, a relatively simple demonstration mission where we may uh, deploy, fabricate a truss in between two CubeSats and do something like a, an interfer interferometry or, um, or, or other long baseline sensing mission. And then we'll build up to be, be doing, to building two dimensional components like uh, large array, large antennas or arrays. And eventually we'll, we'll get to be able to build a whole uh, self fabricating, self assembling spacecraft system. But we, we, can, we believe we can do this in a, a bite sized incremental manner where at each stage we'll have developed a really game changing capability for a, a large number of. NASA and DOD missions. So, but really our long-term goal is to enable the use of in situ resources, you know, asteroid, lunar, Mars type re resources to construct infrastructure in space to support humanity's expansion out throughout the solar system. Systems like But doing that, you know, conquering the space frontier, frontier in this way is going to require revolutionary advances in many, di many different disciplines, uh, including materials and composites. We need really high performance materials that we can use in added and manufacturing processes, um, and yet have them survive the space environment. Um, we need new kinds of additive manufacturing techniques. Uh, most of the 3D printing type processes that involve metals use powders, work, work with powders. And that, that's, to me, in my mind, that's just kind of a nightmare to consider that in the space environment. So we, you know, for many applications we want to be able to use metals, we need new processes to be able to do that. Of course, we need advances in space robotics to be able to do this in a, in at least a semi-automated and hopefully eventually highly automated manner with the closed loop control needed to produce a one kilometer antenna dish and have it have the, the shape accuracy necessary for it to do its, its job. And then advances in in situ resource collection and utilization. How do we capture material? How do we process it in a zero-G environment uh, and, and end up with materials that we can use in these processes? So there's, and there are a, a number of other areas. All, all of these things are much too big for my little company to, to tackle all, our, all on our own. And that's where I see a really strong opportunity for partnership between industry and academia to, to be able to develop and bring all these capabilities to bear to be able to build out our future in space. And if we look at some of the, the how, how we can go about funding this and, and getting this done, um, several, several areas come to mind. Uh, I wanted to point out America Makes, which is a, uh, an organization created by the Obama administration uh, to, to try and uh, foster collaboration between industry and academia and government labs to advance uh, 3D printing additive manufacturing capabilities. And they, uh, several times a year, have been putting out calls for proposal, calls for proposals for uh, teams to address some, some really interesting challenges in the additive manufacturing environment. So if you're interested in these kind of technologies, keep, keep your eye out for that. Uh, we certainly will, and, and we're very interested in partnering with people on that area. Um, of course, NASA and DOD STTR, uh, where uh, industry or small business teams up with uh, university or other nonprofit or organization, is, is a great way to get technologies, uh, you know, developed in the university and in the and in the uh, industry to to meld together and develop new new kinds of products, and. Of course, the Washington State Space Grant uh, is a great program. I love it. Uh, we usually have two or three interns a year um, from them, and we've ended up hiring a number of our employees through that program. So that's an another thing to keep, it, keep in mind. Uh, so um, kind of to wrap, wrap up, um, just wanted to note that this 
you know, th this idea of a, a crazy space spider robot with 3D printers on its hands gotten a lot of attention from the press um, for, for good or bad. Um, but, but I'm happy to say that, that we're responsible for a significant portion of NASA's crazy today. So that's what we're working on. Thanks very much. And I brought it in. Back there? Got one over in the back there. Amit Bandopatai, WSU. Uh, it's exciting, quite a few comments. Uh, I'm working with FDM that you're talking about for 19, 20 years. Uh, some of the things you're talking about, I have the, we have the patents also, not the space side of it, the FDM side of it. Uh, first, one thing you did not touch, but you're going to have tough time, is materials delivery. You talked about the robotic arm side, you talked about the, you know, XYZ control and all these things. That technology matured many years back. It's fantastic now. But long distance, large structures using fuse deposition, the type of design, the system you have to build, you know, football field and all these things, you need many heads. You're not, your yes. system is not going to build it. And that's talking about based on pure experience. Uh, ISRU is true, obviously, you know, we do some stuff with NASA. I know how important it is to them. I didn't see what's your IP. You know, what is the made in space doing today? compared to what you are talking about, where is your intellectual property that you can claim this is our company's product as opposed to just the concepts? I mean, basically, made in space, you know, NASA is putting there, right? So that's the yeah. FDM, FDM system. That's what NASA is doing. I know some of the NASA's internal program with ISRU is through uh, very similar concepts. They're working on it. I probably, maybe you didn't speak about it. What's your IP from what you are doing? Where we have been focusing is on using additive manufacturing type processes, not exactly 3D printing, but, but similar processes to be able to build up large, sparse uh, composite structures. That's kind of our focus. So, so, so those trusses are, uh, that's not really a 3D printing process because we're, we're creating a very regular structure, so we have a very optimized tool for fabricating that. Um, but that, you know, we consider that one part of our IP. But right now we're working on techniques for taking those uh, truss elements and bonding them together, basically welding them together, but using um, uh, composite assembly processes uh, in, to, to create larger um, second-order hierarchy structures. So it's essentially assembling those things in a big structure. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, because the type of structure you're talking about, making a small system in a bigger system, bigger structure, as opposed to normal system, that's also been done, and people are doing it, and there is a big uh, wh system. Where, where has it been done? Uh, go to Oak Ridge. What's that? Go to Oak Ridge National Lab, MDF, Manufacturing Development Facility at Oak Ridge. Yeah, okay. You, sh you should go there, you should see that, and you're talking carbon fiber, exactly carbon fiber, they're doing it. This is licensed to a... Are, are they, but are, are they doing the, the carbon fiber with building it up in layers, or are absolutely. they doing it in no, three no, dimensions? No, 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 absolutely. It's FDM carbon fiber. This has been licensed to uh, this company in Cincinnati. The first commercial machine uh, will be available this year. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical. It's very fascinating. I love it, what you're presenting. I'm just trying to say, you know, since 1995, I'm doing this. have seen many of these things. Sometimes some of them fail. So, you know, good luck with that. Okay, okay. well, to, to address your... Um, comment about needing a lot of eggs, um, you know, to, to, we've gone through the analysis of what it would take to build, you know, a 300 meter scale antenna, and it's basically 2,000 2, kilograms of material. 
because we're because we can optimize it for the zero g environment. And I'm, that you know, yeah. yes, that will be a number of containers of goo or spools of fiber. That, that's not that's not what I meant. What I meant is the nozzle. The nozzle wears out very fast. As you are building the long distance, the tip, the tip you are using to build it, that you, tip wear, uh, wears out FDM tip. Yeah, so it, that's, it, that's if you're meant. doing it with FDM, yeah. Yeah, that's... We, we, we've, as I said, we, we've been focused on composite-based approaches and um, which have different challenges. You know, we have, have to make sure that we don't build up a bunch of goo on the on the material on the tools and get have it plugged up but yeah I, um, I was wondering you were talking about the the technological challenges and sort of turning the printer inside out and I was just wondering how you chose that or why you chose turning the printer inside out and building large structures in a single extrusion or what however you're classifying the build process, as opposed to using a more standard printer to build smaller, kind of like Lego style, and just sort of what, you know, challenges you face with the different, that style, as opposed to longer, bigger structures and why you went that way? Uh, well, we've, we've considered and, and, and looked at, you know, making, you know, we could make structural elements like a truss and then have a 3D printer that would make kind of a joint uh, that you'd, snap these trusses into and we, we did some demos of that in our our phase one effort and, and that that's a viable way of doing it um, but to, to really get to the highly optimized structures um, you want to be able to make you know a truss that's maybe 10 meters long um, you know so so to do that with a traditional machine you'd, you'd need a 10 meter long machine you know, instead we have a, a small machine that fabricates it and pushes it out. It, um, but then if, if you want to use additive processes to build up the joints between them, you need to be able to both do metrology of what you've already built on a fine scale so you can figure out where to position your FDM head or tape layer or whatever it is you're using, as well as global scale metrology so you can look at what you've actually made see how it's deforming under, you know, as things settle, as things cool, as temperatures change, and figure out how to adjust what you're doing so that you end up with a final product that, that meets its requirements. Any more questions? All right. Let's thank uh, Dr. Rob Hoy. Okay. Thank you.